five. Three nine seven one five. <laughs> Well, hello again. We're back again this week, and so are you, apparently, which we love and are super happy about. Seriously, we really appreciate that you continue to listen to the show each week and support us, even though we're not really as funny as we think we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> it's a downright bold face lie. <laughs> While you are listening, if you haven't done so yet, please go push the subscribe button on whichever podcast app that you happen to be listening from so that you can be notified when we put out a new episode. Also, don't forget to follow us on all the social media platforms so you can also be updated about changes and contests that we have. We usually have a drawing about every month to win a Bigfoot for Breakfast t-shirt or a glitter mug, so please don't miss out on those because free stuff. If you want to get a hold of us for any reason to give us a show suggestion, let us know what you think about the show, or if you just have something funny to say, or if you just want to say, hey, you can leave us a message on our Facebook page. You can email us at BigfootForBreakfast at Outlook.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 641-812-2635. If you do leave a voicemail, we'll play it on the air on our next episode. So I'm totally over this quarantine stuff and ready to get on with life. Granted, really... <laughs> It didn't change my life all that much, but the fact that people are telling me that I can't leave my house and I can't go out and not be at home drinking wine with my cats all the time, it makes me want to be out. (laughs) But you like drinking wine with your cats. I will fight you. Jokes about my uh, lack of social life aside, people are really struggling. It's time to put this whole situation to bed. I time like. to put this baby to bed. <laughs> I agree. People are kind of struggling with mental health also. Economically, small businesses may never come back from this, which really sucks. I will never financially recover from this. <laughs> yes. Tiger King reference right there. <laughs> and no one's arm even got bitten off. Completely anticlimactic. I'm pretty cranky. It might yet happen today. She's hungry too. It's migraine Monday. Oh my God. I do think it sucks that all these other big box corporate businesses get to stay open and all the small businesses seem to be suffering the most for this. And I I hate it. It makes no sense. Why are you at less risk of getting infected at Walmart with 300 people than at a mom and pop store with six? I don't know. I hate to make it sound like the COVID-19 thing isn't as big of a deal as it is. But, you know, people are actually dying from the COVID-19. But then we've also got people losing things they've worked for for their whole lives, too. So it's really a double edged sword. It, It sucks all around. And I think people are getting suspicious of the government and what they're up to. While we here at Bigfoot for Breakfast have always been suspicious. Yep, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Always should keep an eye on what your government is up to. And in the spirit of all of this suspicion regarding the federal government, we've decided to stick with that theme this week and talk about a time in which the government really screwed the pooch. Real bad. So it's kind of old news, but at the time it was a really big deal. And I think it really opened up a a lot of people's eyes to what people in a position of power can be capable of. So yeah, I feel like after this situation, a lot of people took the red pill. Oh yeah, absolutely. 100%. This situation changed tons of things in the 90s regarding the federal government, its power. There were a lot of reforms within the government going on. Policies were being rewritten for great reasons and we will see why here pretty soon. So it's always kind of made me think of the Stanford prison experiment. When people are in a position of a authority and they think that they are right because they're being told that they are right. Sometimes they bend the rules to get what they want done because they're the man and they can. Then it goes just a step further and a step further until they're pretty much just doing whatever they want, even at the expense of others. And sometimes that expense is extremely great. Absolutely. So like we said, it's an old story, but we think it's important to cover some of these older ones because there are a lot of people from the younger generations who have never heard them. And I kind of find that a lot lately because everybody's talking about a specific documentary that is really popular at this time. Yeah. That is somewhat directly related. Well, kind of. There's some elements that connect the two. And I say, well, what about this other situation? And they're like, I don't know what that is. You can go ahead and say it. There's the Waco documentary. I didn't want to give away our topic oh we're getting ready to say it anyway and it's the title of the show and stuff so they know oh yeah i guess you guys know (laughs) y'all know know. y'all know anyway so yeah everybody's talking about waco well first of all everybody asked me have you seen that documentary yet and i'm like honestly i've seen a lot of documentaries read a lot of a lot of articles i haven't watched the one that's on netflix right now i haven't either because 
it's devastating and no one wants to be that depressed. Right? Well, we are a product of the 80s. We grew up in the 90s. So Waco and we were from Texas. <laughs> so, so I mean, everybody knew about Waco. But I mean, I think that it's important sometimes for these things to be rehashed just to remember where we screwed up in America and kind of keep things on the right track to be reminded of what can go wrong in a situation like this and remember to keep our eyes open and be vigilant for overactive authority. What really stresses me out is that we live in a time in which some unpleasant facts of American history are being buried and those who don't make a point to remember their history are doomed to repeat it. Yep. And I think that's the whole point. These younger generations, there were so many people that were like, what happened to Waco? And it's like, what? But you got to remember, I mean, it wasn't a topic of conversation when they were growing up. And I just had this exact same situation with the Ruby Ridge when I was talking about which episode I was doing not that long ago Mm -hmm. while I was at work. And a certain young man, actually two of them, swiveled around in their chair and they're like, what's Ruby Ridge? And it just, I mean, it's no fault of their own. I mean, they're just younger than us. It's not a super common topic like it used to be. But God, when we were kids, it was referenced all the time. Anytime the federal government stepped out of line, they talked about Ruby Ridge. It brought it right back up. Well, and I feel like those little, little, quote unquote, because it's not a little situation, but they're not included in updated history books. Are they not? I don't even read updated I history I haven't books. read my daughter's history books, I guess. You know, I don't so. remember learning about Ruby Ridge, no. though, when I was younger. I mean, mm-hmm. it, granted, it happened in 1992, so it wasn't that old yet, I guess. But still, I don't remember us talking about it. It should be in what, civics or modern American. American history or a government class or and maybe it is I don't know I, I don't really know. I hate I hate talking about what they teach in school now because I honestly with history they say that they're they're not teaching accurate history or representing the bad parts like they should but I really have no idea let's go audit some high school history classes next year what you doing what you talking about what you doing in here you tell the truth <laughs> you can't handle the truth <laughs> maybe true that's probably true I don't know I teach my daughter some pretty me too unfiltered the unrated version <laughs> yeah. of a lot of history. We tell the real grim fairy tales. I have a history textbook from 1890. They'll tell you about the Trail of Tears, right? So like we said, it's an old story, but we think it's important to cover some of these older ones because there are a lot of people from the younger generations who have never heard of them. So what's Ruby Ridge, you ask? Well, folks, for those of you who have already heard it, it will be a good refresher. We know it was for us. For those who haven't, you're in for a terrible treat. So the whole event centers around one family, more so one guy. It all seems to begin and end with Randall Claude Weaver, better known as Randy. Now, I wait, the more I got into the whole story... I will say it was Randy and Vicky equally. I'm not, I don't want to put the whole thing on Randy because as you'll see as we go through, I think she was just as much of an influence in this whole thing as he was. Randy was born one of four siblings right here in good old Iowa, raised in Villisca. If you remember, we also did an episode on the Villisca axe murders. You should check that out. It's weird. It's a small world. It really is a small world. His parents were really religious people from the get go, but they kind of hopped around from church to church in his early years years trying to find one that suited them. In 1970, Randy was a private in the U.S. Army assigned to the United States Special Forces Unit at Fort Bragg and was writing letters to a girl back home in small town Iowa named Vicki Jordison. They were a romantic, spontaneous, domestic, happy couple. Randy scored a job with John Deere after he was honorably discharged from the Army and the two were married by 1971. And at that point, Randy enrolled in college at the University of Northern Iowa, where he studied criminal justice, because ironically, he wanted to become an FBI agent. That really didn't work out, because now that he was married and starting a family, he couldn't afford college, so he dropped out. The couple moved to Cedar Falls, Iowa, and Randy worked there at a John Deere factory in town. Five years into their happy marriage, a little girl was born, and they named her Sarah. Sarah, these days, all grown up, she did an interview with PBS for the American Experience, and looking back at this time in her childhood and growing up, she says, quote, I remember hot Iowa summers and cold Iowa 
Winters and Grandma and Grandpa's farm. Things began to slowly change in a new direction after Vicky read a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. You know, that's a really famous book. I had heard of it, but I had ne- I've never read that book. Why this influenced her so? The book talked about interpretations of the Old Testament of the Bible and how they apply to current events leading up to the end of times. A lot of the book predicted that Armageddon was coming and that the persecution of Christians would be imminent during the Great Tribulation and that the true believers would be spared and saved. This book influenced Vicki tremendously, and she began hanging out in libraries, reading more books of this nature, finding comfort and insight in books like Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and other prophetic things of this nature. If you've never read Atlas Shrugged, I definitely recommend. Vicki and Randy were seriously right-leaning conservative people to begin with, and their views really only got much stronger from here. We're not really sure what came first, the chicken or the egg, did Vicky's already existing views influence what she was reading or did the things that she read make her even more suspicious of corporate America and big government? Either way, that's what was happening. She and Randy shared in all of these views and that just got more and more extreme. They were incredibly religious and they found themselves meeting with other folks who felt the same way. Every week at Sambo's restaurant in Cedar Falls. It dictated almost every single part of their lives from what to eat to how to dress. They were isolating themselves more and more from the mainstream life and preparing themselves for what they thought was the end of times. They had a dream. Indeed. They wanted nothing more than to move into the mountains and raise their children without the influence from the outside world in their faces. Don't we all? Yeah. They really wanted to homeschool their kids, and in Iowa at the time, they weren't allowed to do this. Homeschooling in Iowa wouldn't really become legal until July of 1991. In a much later interview with the American Experience PBS, Randy and Vicky's daughter Sarah states, quote, I remember my parents always wanting to move to the mountains. So they learned about how to raise kids without electricity and things like that. And I remember they started to sell things and mom and dad just started to prepare by buying things that you might need living on top of a mountain somewhere. End quote. Keep in mind too that during this time there was a huge farm crisis and the Iowa economy was in shambles. Gas was high, interest was crazy high, ag prices were low, and family farms were going under constantly. Iowa was was really going through a hard time, and keep in mind that Randy worked for John Deere, which is a company who manufactures farm implements for anyone who isn't familiar. So it probably seemed like this was a good time to make a big change. So all of these things were happening just at the time that Vicky and Randy were really getting into all of this Bible prophecy stuff and really finding their way into their deeply embedded religion. All of the crises going on around them and in the economy made them feel like this was the beginning of the end of times. So this pushed them a little more to prepare and to protect their family. Sarah is quoted a few times saying, quote, fear was a big part of it. So prepare they did. And in 1983, they felt like they were ready. Randy drove the van. Vicky followed behind him in their truck, leaving Iowa in the rearview mirror and heading out west to Idaho. They found exactly what they had been looking for, and they paid anywhere between $5,000 and $7,500 for what they saw as the perfect piece of ground. It was 15 acres of land, it had a freshwater spring, and there were boulders kind of strewn throughout the whole area to kind of help them defend their home. The article that we mentioned earlier, written by Associated Press, also gave some testimonies from other people who had known Randy Weaver close to when he had lived in Iowa, prior to moving to the mountains of Idaho. They did say that he seemed paranoid and very, very, very distrustful of pretty much any form of government. He was buying large amounts of ammunition and would tell people that he felt it was necessary to be able to defend themselves against the federal, state, or local authority. Randy felt that he would eventually be involved in some sort of confrontation against authorities and that he had even planned to set up a 300-yard kill zone around his home in order to defend it. You know, do what you gotta do. You know. Now, all of this sounds pretty extreme, yes. But I also have to point out that although these people were quoting some of the more extremist type of things that he was saying, they also said that he never seemed to be talking about an offensive confrontation in which he would be the aggressor. He just seemed to think that they would be coming for him at some point to encroach on his rights up there and wanted to be able to protect his family. 
So there's that. Seems somewhat prophetic. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. Yeah. Up until this next piece of information, I can actually relate to the weavers in a lot of ways. I can't tell you how long I have been trying to talk my husband into moving to the mountains and living in a camper and living off the land. And he says no, because there's no internet. So I get it. I'm definitely not a radical Christian type, but the idea of moving my family away into the quiet mountains, away from in-your-face technology, and the endless distraction of societal norms and opinions sounds absolutely wonderful. Living off of the land, taking things a little slower, raising your kids to work hard for themselves, appreciate what they have, and to just be who they are without all of that other influence, I get it. I really mean that. But here's where Randy loses us a little bit. They've been living now for about a year up on the mountain in a rough cabin that they built themselves. It sounds like the good life and they've been making some friends. This area of Idaho is popular for a certain type of people. Mostly people like the Weavers who are sick of government and modern culture, but also for people with a huge despondence and hate for cultural and racial minorities. Randy was attending meetings of the World Aryan Congress there in Idaho and was an admittedly very racist individual. That part, obviously, we don't agree with. A year after moving to Idaho, they were already getting the attention of the government on a small scale. In January of 1985, Randy had allegedly made some threats against the president along with other members of the government. The Secret Service had been made aware of this somehow, and also the fact that Randy had lots and lots of ammunition and several firearms in this isolated cabin. They already knew that he was associated with some racist ideology, and that he was super paranoid when it came to the federal government. So at that point, they kind of just went up and talked to him. It sounds like it was an okay conversation, in which Randy and Vicky just denied the allegations, stating that the Aryan group did not line up with their religious beliefs, and that was that. But we do know that Randy was affiliated with the Aryan Nations group. The thing about Randy and his affiliation, though, I'm not defending it in any way because obviously we do not like racism. But he never did actually join the group either. I think that their religious views did get in the way of that. They didn't completely agree with everything that the Aryan nations did on the religion side. But I think that a lot of their ideology did align in the way that they were living their religion. There was a lot of talk against Jewish people for the most part. I don't know about any other race, but I know that their religion, the new Jewish people basically weren't real and that they were really involved in the government and they had kind of taken over the federal government and that's why they weren't supportive of the Jewish government. They called it the Zionist government, I think is what they called it. So some of the views aligned with them, but then some not so much. We're just trying to paint the picture of his character, I guess. But also, if you think about living isolated up there in that area, whether they completely aligned with the group or not, it probably made them feel better to know that they weren't alone. And that like their surrounding neighbors kind of would protect each other. So you don't want to be making enemies with everybody else up there either. In February of 1985, only one month after this inquisition from the Secret Service, Randy and Vicky actually went to the county clerk to file an affidavit against the federal government. The affidavit from the Weavers gave, quote, legal and official notice that they believed that they may have to defend themselves from a physical attack on their lives by the FBI. I never really could figure out what that was about, whether it was out of fear from being questioned by the Secret Service about their actions and lifestyle, or if there were some other reasons for the affidavit. We're just really not sure. So before we get into the whole story of Randy's affiliation with the Radical Group, we just want to reiterate that while we do not share in or agree with this type of thinking, We have to present Randy Weaver in a fair and accurate light. We realize that the racial tension has been kind of a hot topic in the past couple of years. And while at times we may seem to disagree with him, there may be times in which it seems that we stick up for him. And that's because during our research, we've come to find that he actually seems like a pretty complicated guy. And we want to portray him in all aspects the best that we can so that you can get a good understanding of the whole story as it was. Just remember, we're stating the facts as we understand them in order to paint a picture. The whole story is full of situations that are difficult to remain unbiased towards, so forgive us if we seem to lean one way or another here. We'll try to keep it under control to an extent. But that's the thing. I mean, you don't have to agree with his affiliations or ideologies 
to disagree with what happened to him. That's what I'm kind of trying to get at. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So there's an article by the Associated Press in which they state that a close friend of Randy's named Von Truman of Evansdale, Iowa, would eventually say of Randy that he really didn't seem to be someone who had racist views until after he moved to the mountains. They stated that he talked of the end of the world, but not of bigoted beliefs. The whole thing was about to go very, very badly, and it kind of was almost a perfect storm that brought about the eventual conclusion. The fact that Randy was attending these meetings ended up being a pretty big deal because it got him noticed. Before Randy was ever introduced to this radical racist group, they were already under investigation. A smaller group called The Order had splintered off from the main Aryan Nations group, and they ended up causing a whole bunch of trouble. Bank robberies, murders, bombing a synagogue, counterfeiting money, anything else you could think of to further their narrow-minded agenda. Now, it's one thing to convene. That's fine. You can have whatever views you want. You can hate whoever you want. You can feel however you want about someone else, even if it's for no reason. That's the beauty of America. You're free to do all of that. It's your right. You can even speak out against people and things that you don't like, even if other people don't like it. But when you start bombing stuff and murdering Jewish talk show hosts and just being hateful in general, you're crossing an obvious line. These are actions of hate, and for obvious reasons, you aren't allowed to do that. And if you want to get the attention of the government, a person would be on the right track with actions like this. So like we said earlier, there's the regular neo-Nazi group there in Idaho. They don't seem to be taking any real action. They're having meetings. They live in their community of like-minded people, and they meet up here and there to talk about whatever it is that neo-Nazi groups talk about. But this other group who calls themselves the Order splintered off and are now a racist terrorist group because there's no other better terminology. But since they were associated with the original group, it's probably kind of tough as far as the federal government goes to tell what's really going on up there in this remote area. The FBI and ATF were honing in on the neo-Nazi groups as a whole there in northern Idaho. And since Randy Weaver has been attending a few of these meetings, he's getting himself all entangled with them. So at this point, from what we can understand, Randy Weaver is basically a doomsday prepper and a white separatist. White separatism is defined as, quote, a form of white supremacy that emphasizes the idea that white people should exist separately from all non-white races, whether by establishing an all-white community somewhere or removing non-whites from their midst. And by removing, we mean like moving yourself away from it, not assassinating them. That's supposedly the deal. They're not really trying to take action against people. They're just trying to go away from them and live on their own in their own way. So they don't like something and they separate themselves from it. It's hard to agree with their outlook, but I guess I can respect the fact that they're simply separating themselves from whatever it is that they don't like out in the mountains as long as they aren't actually bothering or harming others. You do you. And that's kind of what we teach our kids. You know, you don't like something, just ignore it. Don't be around it. If you don't like somebody, don't go by them. I'm not sure that that would be my my solution if my child came up and said I hate an entire race of people. No, but no. the thing is, is like, that's the kind of same, yeah. Yeah. you know, same thinking. Yeah. It's like, well, I mean, I don't really think that's very cool, but yeah. you do you. It's better than the alternative. It's better than a lot of other crap. It's better than spouting hate all over the world like a lot of people do. Yeah. So with the exception of the smaller group who splintered off, it's said in many interviews that while Randy Weaver did associate himself with this crowd of people, and did seem to share in their beliefs, other aspects of his religion did prevent him from ever actually joining the Aryan Nation. This Aryan Nations group that Randy had become affiliated with held an annual conference, and they called it the Aryan World Congress. Randy was there in 1986 at the conference, and he briefly met a guy named Gus Magisano. Gus had been there for most of the day, and he was just kind of scoping things out meeting various people, getting an idea of what this group was all about. He spent the day secretly writing down license plates from the cars of attendees, jotting down notes and key points from the various speakers as well, and the names of the people that he was introduced to. That's weird, right? Well, not really, because Gus Magistano's real name was Kenneth Fadley, and Fadley was an informant for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms who made just the right friends to get him an invitation to the conference that weekend, which worked out famously since the federal government 
government was already keenly interested in the goings-on up in the hills of northern Idaho. Fade Lee was actually hanging around with another guy within the organization, and throughout 1986, he had multiple run-ins with Randy Weaver, not yet becoming friends with him, but they had at the very least become familiar acquaintances. At the next Aryan World Congress in 1987, Fade Lee once again bumped into Randy, and Randy seemed happy to see him, greeting him warmly. That day, he was able to spend more time with Randy, getting to know him a little bit better, and over the next three years or so, they got to be buddies. Unbeknownst to Randy, he invited the ATF informant to his home in July of 1989, in order to discuss forming a militia group to fight what he called the Zionist Organized Government, which is just the United States government. At some point after this, Fadley, knowing that the Weavers were suffering financially, offered Randy something that he couldn't refuse. Randy was broke and having a lot of trouble supporting his family up there in the mountains. Fadley was telling Randy that he knew how he could make some money. He said that if Randy would hook him up with two illegally sawed-off shotguns, he had a buyer for them. Three months later, around October of 1989, that's just what he did. He sawed off those shotguns and sold them to the ATF informant. I just feel like it's entrapment. You're baiting somebody who's desperately in financial need and they trusted you and it's just it's such a double-edged sword because you're gonna have people that say well bottom line he did something illegal i get it and i just want to throw in there too that supposedly these shotguns were sawed off illegally by an eighth of an inch so a lot of people were saying that it looked like he tried to saw them off to the legal amount but it was like literally the saw blade difference that he missed his mark by one eighth of an inch. So they got him on it. And that was the end of it. I mean, they just did. And it would have honestly, and uh, I have a background in law enforcement. So I'm kind of a black or white person. You break the law. It's what it is. I'm, but I'm totally a gray area. In person. this situation, I feel like if it had been his idea to offer selling the illegal firearms, it would have been different than the fact that he was baited based on a known financial need. Wait until you find out what happens next, Sam. Yeah. Oh, I know what happened. But it's so jacked up. Like we said, it's hard to agree with a lot of things that Randy Weaver was doing. But at the same time, oh, it's just, it's such a mess. Anyway. So it wasn't until eight months later in June of 1990 that Randy was approached about his illegal sale of firearms. Eight months later. They just sat on it till I, it was useful, mm -hmm. which is, that's what you do when you're building a case. But when he was approached by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms at that time, they weren't there to arrest him. They actually spoke to Randy Weaver regarding the possibility of him becoming an informant for them. They wanted him to use his already trusted involvement with the Aryan Nations to gather information and pass it along to them, and they told him that they would make the sale of illegal firearms charge conveniently disappear should he agree to do this. Randy staunchly refused to do this, saying that he wouldn't be a snitch. I can't imagine that this interaction with federal officials eased his already existing distrust of them in any way. Now, we do believe in personal accountability, but we felt that we had to mention that Randy felt that the gun charge was entrapment because it plays a big part later on in the story. So that was that. A warrant would be issued for the arrest of Randy Weaver, but for whatever reason, the ATF agents who were already present that day had made the determination that it would be too dangerous that day to arrest him at his home. So, they left without messing with it, wanting to catch him off guard in a better situation. The ATF agents made a plan, and then six months later, in January of 1991, they parked a car on his road, put the hood up, and pretended to be stranded motorists. And at that point, they sat there, and waited for Randy to come by. Now, we're not really sure if they knew that he would be going by. They had been watching him, so they might have known his actions and his schedule. If not, I can only guess that they just kind of put themselves in his path of travel should he leave his home. I'm not really sure how they worked that out, but Randy and Vicki Weaver did go by, and they did stop to help. Of course, at that point, they told Randy that he was under arrest for the illegal sale of firearms, to which he replied, Nice trick. You'll never do that again. I'm not really sure how long Randy sat in jail for this, but I don't think it was more than just a day or two. He was arraigned and then released on personal recognizance. His trial was set that day for February 19th, 1991. The fact that they had tricked Randy and then arrested him made an already paranoid and distrustful Vicky very upset. And when they got home, she fired off a couple of strongly worded letters to the United States Attorney's Office. Turns out Vicky was quite the little letter writer. We looked and looked for the actual letters that Vicky had sent, but could only find quotes from them from a few different sources. 
From the looks of it, the letters are called the Queen of Babylon letters because Vicky addressed them to the servant of the Queen of Babylon, even though they were sent directly to the U.S. Attorney's Office. The letters were received on February 7, 1991, but they were dated only a few days after the release of her husband. Part of the first letter is quoted on justice.gov to have said, A man cannot have two masters, Yahweh, Yahshua, Messiah, the anointed one of Saxon Israel is our lawgiver and our king. We will obey him and no other. A long forgotten wind is starting to blow. Do you hear the approaching thunder? It is that of the awakened Saxon. War is upon the land. The tyrant's blood will flow. End quote. The second letter stated the same idea. Yah Yahshua, the Messiah of Saxon Israel, is our advocate and our judge. The stink of your lawless government has reached heaven, the abode of Yahweh our Yahshua. Whether we live or whether we die, we will not bow to your evil commandments. So there's that. These people already had a negative view of the government, obviously, and at that point, they had basically felt that Randy had been entrapped by them when an informant led him to sell an unregistered firearm. Now, these other officers are telling Randy that the only way out of it is to do what they want and help them out or he's going to prison for the crime that they led him to commit. He had always felt like the government worked against people unconstitutionally, and this provided him a great example of that. And to be fair... Also, while he was in prison, they were kind of still trying to talk him into it. And they were telling him things that, or while he was in jail, I guess, not prison. They were still trying to talk him into that. And they were telling him things like that they could take his land. So they were making him really nervous about what they could take from him. And he'd been working really hard. You know, they saved up the money to get this land. They built their house and were living the way they wanted to. And now they're threatening to just take whatever he had there. So, I mean, you can imagine a person like this was taking that pretty personally. U.S. Attorney's Office found some of the language in the letters to be somewhat threatening. The whole tyrant's blood will flow thing. Yeah, yeah. Whether we live, whether we die. (laughs) So they sent him off to the United States Marshal in Boise, asking them to perform a threat assessment. We have officially assessed that this is, in fact, a threat. Indeed. (laughs) In the meantime, remember that Randy Weaver had court for the gun charges on February 19th. That was the date that they told him on that day. But the court date had actually been changed from the 19th to February 20th. That's all fine. It happens. But when the letter was sent to Randy to let him know of the change in court date, the letter erroneously stated that his court date was actually March 20th, not February 20th. Once the attorney's office figured out their error... Supposedly, the lawyer appointed to Randy tried to contact him by leaving messages for him via telephone. Keep in mind, Randy didn't have a telephone. There was some sort of community message phone. I don't know, is what I understand. And they sent him letters. He never got a response. They went ahead with the trial on February 20th, which he would have no idea that there was a trial on February 20th. And of course, Randy didn't show up. By the court documents for this instance, it doesn't sound like they knew whether or not Randy had received the messages regarding the change in trial date or if he had contacted pretrial services, but they went ahead and issued a bench warrant for his arrest at this time. Apparently, they later found out that someone else by the name of Bill Gerder had been picking up the Weaver's mail for about three weeks as of this time. I'm not sure whether this was a neighbor or something or why he was picking up the mail. Who knows if Randy actually even got the letters or not. But the fact that they issued a bench warrant when they knew that there was a huge questionable circumstance and a clerical error on their part. Actually, I don't even know why I'm surprised about that. Because typically, anytime there's a clerical error when it comes to the government, it's still your fault. Right. That's not even unusual. (laughs) At this point, it sounds like it became the responsibility of the U.S. Marshal Service to collect Randy and get him to trial. What was it that we said the last time? I don't want to be collected. A week later, February 27th, the U.S. Marshal for Idaho asked that another letter be sent to Randy about the error in the letter for his trial date and to notify him that a bench warrant had indeed been issued for his arrest. He wanted the letter to let him know that he needed to contact pretrial services so that they could get this worked out. The attorney's office never did it. Right. So you can already tell that the U.S. Marshals looked at this and they were like, um, this is jacked up. Maybe try to send him another letter. Contact him. You know, that's what I take from that. Yeah. They're like, bro, do the things. Right. And they didn't. They didn't do the things. They didn't do the things. And then there's times they did do too much things. So <laughs> over the next week, various conversations and meetings were held regarding this matter on how to proceed. However, nobody ever just like white flag walked up to the door and was like, man, hey, there was the issue. They, they did the first time and then they kind of assessed it and felt like there's a 300 yard kill zone. And yeah. they didn't want to do that. I mean, he's a scary guy. Yeah. Really? I can sure. kind of see their point. So in the end, they decided to go ahead with 
with the indictment, but since the letter sent to Randy erroneously stated that his court date was on March 20th, they would just drop the charges if he actually shows up on that day for court. So which was, is fair. Yeah, their initial plan was to just wait till March 20th yeah. and see, but, but then, but then, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so even though they had discussed this, they went ahead and sent the indictment through to a grand jury for the weapons charge and failure to appear, which to us makes no sense, especially since they didn't even yet know whether or not the huge clerical error that gave Randy the wrong court date was the reason that he didn't show up. And the court date that Randy had been given had not yet even come for them to know whether he would show up or not. Also, when the indictment information was sent to the grand jury, they just decided not to include the whole clerical error thing. Yeah. Let's leave out the part where we fucked up. I'm just at a loss. (laughs) No, it's astounding, isn't it? So (laughs) astounding. There's so many twists and turns to this where you're just like, what? (laughs) There are definitely... There's a lot of face palms. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Because Randy Weaver, like he, Randy and Vicky, they're not exactly presenting themselves as non-threatening either, you know? So it's kind of like, well, there's sometimes they're kind of asking for trouble here, you know? But then the other side, the government is kind of just screwing everything up really bad too. They've put themselves in a bad situation. They did put themselves in a bad situation, but... And I could... I try to see it from both sides where they are a family who thinks they are under attack and she's mama bearing it. You know, she's going full honey badger. She is. She's definitely honey badger. But does that warrant... I mean, what price do you pay for that? So far, all they've really done is talk. That's it. Yeah. But I mean, keep in mind too, this is kind of a different time. I mean, even now, those people who isolate themselves up in communities, which is a common thing today, the federal government doesn't like that. The federal government doesn't like those people because they don't know what they're up to up there and it freaks them out. And you know, they sit in their offices just wondering what what's going on, you know, and then they get themselves all worked up and bad things happen. I want to control you. And even though we can't agree with a lot of things that Randy Weaver has you just said, can't hate Jews. The thing is, as much as we want the world to be all encompassing and all accepting, we can't make people fit in a box. There's going to be things that we don't like. And there's going to be people that you just have to ignore in life and not worry about. It, it just is what it is. And there's going to be people who want to separate themselves. You're not everybody's cup of tea. It's a slippery slope. But at the end of the day, living on the fringes of society, that's not illegal. No. And I'm a firm believer that whether I like it or not, they can believe what they want as long as you aren't actively out killing people or harming them. There's a lot of people that live in ways that I disagree with but are still constitutionally sound. And I believe so much in the Constitution and our rights and not letting any of our rights be infringed upon as much as we can by the federal government. Because once you take that step, you can't go back. Or by private citizens. By anybody. So, I mean, you just got to let sleeping dogs lie sometimes. Let them be who they are. Let them do what they do. If you want to live your life in hate in the mountains, do it. Do it. A lot of people don't agree with the way I live my life. That's true. I just like cats. Jeez. (laughs) A lot of cats. (laughs) You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. In the meantime, the U.S. Marshal's Office was ordered to execute this warrant, and they made a plan for surveillance on Randy Weaver. They basically just wanted to get an idea of the layout of the land and assess whether or not they would be able to safely make contact with him. Reasonable. Reasonable. They had a few meetings in which they discussed different ways to approach the situation. They thought that the use of intermediaries might be their best and safest option. They requested the involvement of a special operations group within the U.S. Marshal Service. This group was trained for hostage negotiations and complex situations that involve federal fugitives. This group would begin information gathering and plan development for the arrest of Randy Weaver after they would arrive in Idaho. On October 9, 1991, a man who was known to be a friend of the Weavers had been seen bringing them supplies and interacting with them. One of 
of the marshals talked to him and asked if he would give Randy a message. Because keep in mind, since Randy got arrested, it he didn't come down off that mountain for 18 months. He stayed there because he thought that they would just arrest him. So he just stayed, stayed where he was at. They exchanged a few messages back and forth, negotiating a surrender. Finally, Randy sent out a letter on October 12, 1991. It said, quote, the U.S. government lied to me. Why should I believe anything that servants have to say? This situation was set up by a lying government informant whom your lawless courts will honor. Your lawless one world beast courts are doomed. I have appealed to Yahweh's court of supreme justice. We will stay here separated from you and your lawless evil in obedience to Yahshua the Messiah. The U.S. Marshals then decided to send in a new message saying that if Randy would surrender, the government wouldn't interfere with Vicky's custody or of the kids or bother them at all. Well, that's threatening. Well, I think that he had expressed his concern. Okay. In in the letter. Because the quote I just read was just a small piece. Okay. I promise we won't hurt you. <laughs> Why would you say that? That no. sounds very threatening. I think that he had expressed <laughs> concern because they had been threatening to take okay. his land and different things when mm-hmm. he was in jail. So they also tried to put him at ease that his land would be left alone as well because he apparently made a statement at some point that he was concerned about some of these things and that he didn't really want to be tried in a... Idaho court because he felt that it was prejudice against people who believed in white separatism. Before the message of the U.S. Marshals could be sent to them, Vicki sent one out to them first, asking a number of questions. She asked one, why a government informant or agent cannot be cross-examined by a defense attorney? Right? Two, why did the U.S. District Judge in Coeur d'Alene tell us that if we lost our case, we would also lose the $10,000 bond to pay the attorney? Three, why is there a concerted effort to set up for prison or murder all ex-Green Berets. My husband is an ex-Green Beret. We know that there are those already in prison from setups. They all went to court expecting justice from the courts of the country they loved. They didn't receive any. So you see a number of things there. Obviously, they've been told something that wasn't true, trying to get information out of them. As and far you as know, we know, it's not true. Well, they're telling them that they're going to take their land and kids and stuff if they don't do what they want. We know that's not a thing. It shouldn't be anyway. But they were apparently told this. So now they're more suspicious and scared to come down because they don't trust them. And they're under this impression, and obviously I don't know if that's true, about the Green Berets being set up. But they're kind of expressing the idea that they're scared to come down because they They don't know what the courts are intending. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Really take the extreme opposite end of what you just said for the sake of this discussion. The government could do those things. At any point, they could absolutely take their land because it was being used for the use of a federal crime. The ATF could do that. He sold illegal firearms and he had other firearms. Okay. So there's a possibility that they could skew the facts or I mean they might not even need to skew the facts oh we'll find out later in this situation that the people involved in this are not above skewing facts that's okay so I'm taking the end of this which is 100% in defense of the people being quote unquote persecuted by the government that's where I'm arguing at this point so they were right in their fear okay so this might reflect some of my personal beliefs a little bit as far as the whole Green Beret conspiracy many a cover up has been executed to benefit the government or agents thereof. Say he was in a unit that was because Green Berets do some off the books shit. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there for. Right. There absolutely could have been people in his unit that were questionably discharged. (laughs) Not dis. No. I meant like like arrested. (laughs) Yeah. Like (laughs) disappeared. Yeah. Or arrested as in quote unquote neutralized. Mm hmm. For any unknown reason to us. Okay. You know. So she's not being completely unreasonable in this situation. No. I know that there are a lot of people out there who aren't big on conspiracy, but that is not us. And I would say that those people just aren't well researched. I'll say it. No, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> dig, dig deeper. Okay. I want to offer all perspectives, all possibilities. I don't want anything to be dismissed in this story from one extreme view to the other and gray areas in between. I- yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Okay. And I think it does deserves that. I think that there are things that one side did right and the other side did right, things that both sides did wrong. So, I mean, we've got to include reasonable perspective here. And unreasonable perspective. And even if it is unreasonable perspective, it's what they felt. They exactly. they felt this way and they were scared. So, I kind of see, they kind of thought, well, if we just stay here, they can't take it. 
we worked hard for this. We saved our money for it. We built this place. This is our place. And they're not taking it from us. I'd stay the hell up there, too. They aren't taking my mountain. Stay off my mountain. So anyway, she's <laughs> like it to get the picture of this, that last paragraph before I interjected my devil's advocate part. She's reading these things like, well, you know, we don't know if this Green Beret thing is true. I don't Head turned sideways, eyes are squinting. I well, didn't. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> Which we, I mean, we don't, but I can't help it. There is rumor. There is speculation. So yeah. she's sitting there trying to say these things and she's getting my sideways head cock, squinty eyed. Well. <laughs> okay. So the U.S. Marshals drafted a new letter in which they addressed her questions and they sent it to the U.S. Attorney's Office for approval. The attorney's office came back and said that they weren't going to approve any more negotiations because Randy Weaver is represented by a lawyer. And really, he should be communicating through his lawyer alone. Not only that, the negotiation tactics and conditions were going beyond the scope of the attorney's office at this point, which I get that. But think about that from the Weaver's perspective. They sent this letter asking all these questions and then bam, shut down communication. It just looks bad. It's poorly handled. Oh, wait. It gets so much worse. But So at this point, negotiations are done. But surveillance continues. We're going to watch them, but we're not going to talk to them. Observe and report. So since it was wintertime now in Idaho, surveillance was really difficult and came to a standstill. But bad weather came and went, and on March 4th of 1992, U.S. Marshals drove up the Weaver's Road just to kind of check things out. There were two of them. This thing between the law and Randy Weaver was going on two years at this point. According to court documents, when the marshals got there, they were met with large signs in the driveway that said white power is supreme and bow down to Yahweh. They were going to turn around because apparently they didn't really have any intention of engaging with Randy, only to look around. Directly after that, they were met by Randy Weaver carrying a rifle and two of Randy's armed children on the rocks above them. They told Randy that they were looking to buy some property, which they could pull off because luckily the officers were in plain clothes and an unmarked truck. Randy told them to come back with a realtor, and that was that. The two U.S. Marshals left. So, he's not like he's shooting at them. He's just saying, don't come any further. Come back with a realtor. So, we had mentioned two more of Randy's kids. By this time, Randy and Vicky had four little ones running around. They already had Sarah before they moved to Idaho, but now they had a boy named Sam. They call him Sammy. Another girl named Rachel and a new baby named Elisheba. At this point, the U.S. Marshals really felt that it was just too dangerous to even think about confronting Randy at the Weaver land. They didn't really see a reasonable tactical option for doing so without endangering the lives of Vicky and the kids. The director of the Marshal Service in Idaho called the U.S. Attorney's Office explaining the situation and their feelings. They asked that they just dismiss the bench warrant and issue a warrant under seal. What this means is that the warrant information is not released to the general public. This would take some of the pressure off the Attorney's Office to get it done, and possibly make Randy think that it was more safe to leave the mountain, allowing them to arrest him later in a more safe manner for both family and officers involved. Reasonable. The attorney's office said nah. 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 The judge had already made it known that he wanted Weaver arrested and they wouldn't dismiss it. The director of the U.S. Marshal's office then said that he would go to Boise and speak to the judge himself. But apparently, the judge declined this meeting altogether. I really feel like the U.S. Marshal's office is trying to do the right thing. I do too. Honestly, up until a certain point, the U.S. Marshals, it seemed like they really investigated the situation, looked at things as they were, and saw and, the flaws, and really tried to go about safety of everybody, of Randy, of Vicky, the kids themselves, which that's what you do as a cop. So they were trying to appeal to everyone and say, this isn't right. We shouldn't be doing this. This is a bad idea. All of this for a bench warrant. You know, and this is where you see the difference in approach and in practice for the people who are wearing suit and ties sitting in an office for the attorney's office and the people who are actually on the front lines doing the hard work. And also the judge doing that makes me feel like it was more of just a personal situation. He had publicly made it known that we're going to get Randy Weaver, you know, up on that mountain and he's not going to get away with this. And it makes me think that he feels like he's going to look weak or something, you know, by going back on it and trying to do it another way. 
He just wants them to do it because that's what he said. And I hate that. We now relinquish the soapbox for a moment. (laughs) (laughs) The U.S. Marshals decided on increased surveillance. Basically, this included them setting up real-time video cameras throughout the land owned by the Weavers. Most of the time, moving around in the dark around their home and throughout the trees, observing the Weavers' responses to certain noises around the property that put them on high alert, during which the Weaver children would often run to the tops of certain rock formations with their guns. More trips to the Weaver compound under the cover of darkness were warranted when the camera batteries proved insufficient and had to be replaced with solar panels. Periodically, the cameras would stop operating and when the marshals would go check it out, they would find that it had been stolen. Okay, question before we go any further. I was wondering about this. Is it even legal for the marshals to, even with a warrant, can they go on their property and, like, put up cameras and sneak around? The federal government can do some shady shit. I would think that they would have to have a warrant for every separate time that they came on to the property. And they might have. But I don't know exactly how that works for them on an ongoing investigation. I don't know. I don't either. The already paranoid Weaver family is dealing with people running around on their land, Eagle Six going dark, in the dark, and setting up cameras throughout their property. I'm sure that didn't settle their paranoia at all. Keep in mind, also, that at this point, the only thing that Randy Weaver had actually done illegally was selling two one-eighth of an inch, two short, sawed-off shotguns, and he had been in jail and released and still hadn't actually made it to the point of his... I don't know now. We don't know if, if it's March... 20th yet okay it, yeah but so he didn't show up for that court date okay but so, who yeah. knows i mean he may have still been thinking february 19th we didn't yeah. know if he went on february 19th and no one was there yeah you know what i mean i don't know i i have my suspicions that randy weaver probably did not intend did not to go to court yeah. <laughs> i don't know that's just totally my judging from randy weaver from what i can surmise that's right i don't think he wanted to i don't think he was going probably not but anyway so yeah the only thing that he had done is sell those illegal firearms to questionably illegal firearms and didn't show up for court so at what extent like to what extent do you go to make that arrest and the not showing up for court thing is like so that's it the other things that he was doing and involved in were merely questionable but 100 percent within his rights The U.S. Marshals now had a plan to send an undercover man and woman in to buy land just north of the Weavers, and they were to pretend that they were a couple clearing the land to build a house. They hoped that Randy would befriend them and could be arrested. But the approval for the plan took three months, and by then, they felt that they needed to resurvey the land once more in order to move forward since they hadn't been there for a while. This is where the long sigh starts. Yeah. According to the report of the Ruby Ridge Task Force put out by the U.S. Department of Justice, on August 21st, 1992, six U.S. Marshals went up to the mountain to perform this survey surveillance and check for viable cover areas. Now here's where the story gets murky. The feds and the weavers both tell vastly different versions of this part. During this visit, they were detected by the weaver's dog. Now wait, this is the Marshall side. Yeah. Who started chasing them, who was likely trained to alert the family of unwanted visitors on their land, probably after finding all the cameras. Well, and period. They live out in the yeah. middle of Idaho, like in the in the freaking wilderness. The six men retreated with the dog closely behind, and behind the dog was 13-year-old Sammy Weaver, Randy, and a friend of the Weavers named Kevin Harris. Randy encountered the marshals first, and when he did, they announced themselves, at which time Randy turned and ran the other way. The dog then caught up to the marshals, and supposedly, from the standpoint of the marshal, one of the deputies kept the dog at bay with a gun, but did not shoot the dog because they were afraid of provoking the family. But two of the deputies stood to identify themselves. These were Deputy Cooper and Deputy Deegan. The marshals state that when they did this, Kevin Harris turned and fired at them with a 30 6 rifle, hitting and killing 
the 42-year-old Deputy Marshal William Deegan. Deputy Cooper returned fire at Kevin Harris, missing him, and then turned to focus his weapon on Sammy Weaver, but he didn't pull the trigger. Another Marshal named Deputy Roderick was a little farther down the path, and about the time he heard these shots, he saw the dog go running by in the direction that Randy Weaver ran, but when the shots went off, the dog alerted toward him. He went ahead and shot the dog so that it wouldn't alert Randy Weaver in his direction. Well, Randy might not have seen this happen, but 13-year-old Sammy did, and he got really upset. Sammy turned and fired a shot with his rifle at Deputy Roderick. Deputy Cooper heard the shot and rose to fire three cover shots, trying to get to Deputy Deegan, who he said was yelling for help. After he fired these shots, he says that he saw Sammy Weaver running up the hill toward his cabin after his father. Okay, so that's the Marshall story about the fired shot. But, like we said, Kevin Harris and Randy Weaver tell a very different tale. According to them, they were hunting in the woods that day, and Sammy Weaver's dog, Stryker, alerted. They chased after him thinking that they were pursuing a large animal, when suddenly the dog was shot, and that this was the first shot fired. In fast response to the shooting of his dog and not knowing who was shooting, Sammy got upset, yelling, You shot my dog, you son of a bitch! And he fired the shot back in the direction of Deputy Roderick. They stated that Deputy Deegan and Deputy Roderick then fired back at Sammy and had not identified themselves so they still didn't even know that they were marshals. Sammy was still running from the gunfire so at this point Kevin Harris stated that he fired back at them in order to defend Sammy. He was trying to stop the shooting from the marshals in order to give Sammy enough time to get away. So he was kind of just providing cover Cover. fire to get Sammy enough time. So there are two different sides to this story, obviously. One group says that the other shot first and vice versa. One of the marshals was also a medic, and he tried to resuscitate Deputy Deegan unsuccessfully. Not long after the Weaver's retreat, they heard another succession of gunfire followed directly by a bunch of screaming and crying. At this point, two of the marshals went back to town to look for help while the others stayed because they, one, didn't want to leave Deputy Deegan behind, and two, didn't know where the Weavers were, so they were worried that they would be shot at if they left. For the record, the Weavers did not return to shoot them at any point after this. So I'm going to go ahead here too and offer my biased opinion. I completely 100% feel like the Weaver story is more believable. Me too. I feel like the dog was going to give away cover. This was Sammy's dog. He was raised with the dog. I mean, they're an isolated family. That dog was everything. It was his best friend. And some guy that he didn't know yet stood up out of the woods and shot it. And he reacted in an emotional response of a 13-year-old boy. And uh, I don't know. 13-year-old boy who had been raised to defend his property with firearms. Yep. I don't don't know. It's just, I just really feel in my heart that the Weavers were telling the right story at this point. I refuse to believe that our government would change the story to defend their own actions. <laughs> in the interview that Sarah Weaver did years later with Crime Watch Daily, she talked about the situation from her perspective back at the cabin. She said that early in the morning, the dog started to bark. I don't know about you guys, but when my dogs bark, I can tell the difference between them just barking and them warning that someone was there. And that's kind of what Sarah was talking about. She said that they could tell that they were definitely barking at someone or something. So Randy, Kevin, and Sammy decided to go try to figure out what it was. And from there, she states that, quote, It wasn't long, and I heard gunshots, and that made me jump. I was beating myself up for not going with my little brother. I heard more gunshots, and then I heard my dad yelling, Sam, Kevin, get home. Finally, her dad came running back toward the house alone. And Sarah asked him what had happened. She said that he told her he wasn't sure yet what had happened, that they ran into someone in camouflage. He heard Sam say, I'm coming, Dad, and he had assumed that Sam was right behind him. Sarah goes on to say that Kevin came walking up the trail shortly after and he was crying. One very important thing that the Weavers were painfully aware of at this point, and that the Marshals claimed not to know, is that in this hail of disorganized, emotionally driven gunfire, 13-year-old Sammy Weaver had been killed. In the interview with Sarah Weaver, she remembered that they had brought 13-year-old Sam up to the shed outside of their home. They cleaned him up and wrapped him in a sheet. He had been shot in the back. The U.S. Marshal's Office got word of the gunfight and the stranded officers on the mountain and immediately requested assistance from the FBI's hostage rescue team. The scene was immediately secured by them and after dark that night, the stranded marshals were rescued by the Idaho State Police. 
No additional gunfire was received from the Weavers upon rescue either. Until the FBI would arrive, the local police and the marshals set up posts and guarded the access road. It wasn't long before a crowd of townspeople and friends of the Weavers were gathered at the road wondering what had happened there. Before the FBI arrived as well, they were briefed on the Weaver's background and the situation. Based on this, the commander of the hostage rescue team and the FBI associate director took it upon themselves to create a special set of rules of engagement for the situation. And these rules included, 1. If any adult male is observed with a weapon prior to the announcement, deadly force can and should be employed if the shot can be taken without endangering any children. 2. If any adult in the compound is observed with a weapon after the surrender announcement is made and is not attempting to surrender, deadly force can and should be employed to neutralize the individual. 3. If compromised by any animal, particularly the dogs, that animal should be eliminated. 4. Any subjects other than Randall Weaver, Vicki Weaver, Kevin Harris presenting threats of death or grievous bodily harm, the FBI rules of deadly force are in effect. Deadly force can be utilized to prevent the death or grievous bodily harm. Deadly force can be utilized to prevent the death or grievous bodily injury to oneself or that of another. So basically they changed the rules of engagement to say that if anybody looks as though they might be armed, shoot them. Doesn't matter if they're standing with their back to you. Doesn't matter if they're running from you. Just shoot them. So obviously we can see a lot of flaws with this new set of rules of engagement. Oh, and I also want to say too that I read supposedly... When the marshals called and asked for the FBI and were saying that they had been attacked, first they said that they had been attacked by the Weavers. The reason we keep putting it in here as a compound is because that was a word used by the marshals when radioing back or went to get help. They said that they referred to the Weavers' cabin as a compound with an unknown number of militant people attacking them. So the response to this, if you look at the pictures on the internet, it literally looks like they're trying to invade a state. There's tanks, there's helicopters. There are armed trucks, bulldozers, and well over, well over two or three hundred men to take down this family of seven in a plywood box. Oh, yeah. Four children. Three adults. Three adults. And Kevin, he is described a couple times as a family friend, but it come to find out he was kind of a younger kid. And when he was a teenager, he'd been in some trouble here and there and the Weavers kind of adopted him. And so he was pretty much living there and he really looked up to Randy Weaver as a father figure. So he was very much in the family. The FBI decided to send in basically an armed robot with a phone attached to it, but the robot was not loaded with ammo. They were also worried that the Weavers might be positioned in the woods. So they decided to position snipers in the woods around the house just in case. When the snipers arrived, Arrived to their positions, they radioed back to headquarters that the Weavers were not positioning themselves for a fight, but that they were outside their cabin. The snipers received a response that the rules of engagement still applied. The rules of engagement applied to a family unit that does not appear to be in an aggressive stance. No, they're literally in their yard. So the snipers started checking things out. They observed first an unarmed girl running from the cabin to a rocky area, and then back to the cabin. After this, they saw an unarmed man on the back porch of the Weaver home. So far, so good. But about 10 minutes later, a helicopter was heard flying overhead. At this time, the young girl and two adult males ran from the cabin to the rocks. A few seconds later, a sniper named Lon Horiuchi noted a man standing near an outbuilding holding a rifle and scanning the sky with it as though he were looking for the helicopter. According to reports, his back was to Lon Horiuchi and the helicopter when Horiuchi took the shot. When the shot went out, the man ducked quickly behind the shed. The man was Randy Weaver, and he was hit, but not badly. Another thing that I also read, supposedly when Horiuchi took the shot, I don't know how true this is. This is also just hearsay. He radioed back saying that he saw him shooting at the helicopter, but the people in the helicopter actually said, no, there were never any shots fired at us. So that was a dispute too, but it really didn't go anywhere. I don't know if he really did. That was just something that was thrown out there too. So that may not even be true. What was the other guy's name that we kept saying? That we hated? I don't remember. What was his name? Dodie. Yeah. No, Richard Dodie. Richard Dodie. <laughs> I forgot about Dodie. <laughs> now, the story is told here from the perspective of the Weavers as well. Keep in mind that the feds say at this time they don't know that Sammy is dead. This outbuilding that Randy was walking out to from the house was called the birthing shed. 
They called it that because this is where Vicki Weaver had birthed her children. It was kind of a chicken house looking shed, but it was insulated on the inside and it had a made up bed inside. So this was also where guests would stay when they came to visit the Weavers. So when they carried Sammy's body back to the house, they put him in this bed. So according to the Weavers, Randy was going out to the shed to see his son one last time. So at this point, the Weavers are thinking that they were chasing their dog earlier today and were ambushed by feds in the woods on their land. So that's their perspective. So just from all of the things that we described going up to that point, we know that the marshals were already super nervous about being in the woods on Randy Weaver's property. They had tried to get the judge to go about it in a different way, and he said no. They already weren't very kicked about it, and when they realized that the Weavers had seen them, I'm sure it was kind of an oh shit moment. And when the Weavers saw that the feds were unexpectedly popping out from the brush cover, I think that the whole situation, the way that it happened, just surprised everyone, and nobody was really thinking rationally. So people died for no reason. But from the perspective of the Weavers, they were ambushed. The marshals killed their son. And now, hours and hours have passed with seemingly no activity, and they've got someone trying to pick them off from a mountaintop while they stand in their yard and care for their son and are still figuring things out. So, I mean, looking at what they're seeing here, I'm sure it's really scary. They don't really know for sure what's going on, how many people are out there, what they're doing, if they plan to just kill them. After about 10 seconds, Horiyuchi saw his earlier target again. Again, along with the young girl and Kevin Harris running for the cabin. As they ran into the house trying to escape, Horiyuchi pulled the trigger again, firing two shots in quick succession, taking a shot through an open door just in front of Kevin Harris as he ran through. The first shot missed Harris. The second shot hit him in the arm. The bullet went through Kevin's arm and lodged in his chest, breaking ribs and collapsing his lung. So at this point, they're running away from him. To take cover. Yeah. And he shot him. And at no point does it say that they're actually armed. Kevin Harris, it said earlier, wasn't armed. The only one that they I mean, said now. was armed. Oh, I don't know if he is. I don't think he is. He was just, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was. I don't think it matters if he's armed, if he's running away from you. He's not he, an aggressor and you can't shoot people in the back. No. And the thing is, there's a lot of people who talk a lot of crap about how they walk around with guns. They're gun-toting Americans out there, you know, and their kids have guns. But if you really think about it, if I lived in the mountains of Idaho where there are wolves and bears all over the place, my kids would be armed too in the woods. Always. I would teach them to shoot a gun and protect themselves. So it's really not that unusual in that area. I guarantee it. Guarantee lots of kids learn to shoot at an early age and carry guns. So anyway, in an interview done years later with True Crime Daily, Sarah Weaver, who would be 16 years old at this time, describes this moment. She said, I was right in line with my mom and I literally heard and felt the loudest boom in my ear and I felt stuff hit my face and my mom just dropped and I felt Kevin from behind me just fall through the front door and everyone around me was dropping. The shot that he took in that moment severely wounded Kevin Harris and hit Randy's wife, Vicki Weaver, directly in the head as she held open the door for her family to come into the house and as she was holding their 10-month-old daughter, Elisheba. She dropped to the floor immediately, dead, right there in front of her husband and her children. Elisheba dropped to the floor as well, covered in her mother's blood. In later testimony in the Ruby Ridge trial, FBI sniper Lon Horiuchi would be called to testify regarding this. In his cross-examination, he stated that he was shooting at Kevin Harris and did not see Vicki Weaver standing behind the door. He also stated that after he fired that last shot, he could hear a woman screaming for approximately 30 solid seconds. We know that Vicki was immediately gone, so we can only assume that the screams that he heard were those of Vicki Weaver's 16-year-old daughter, Sarah. The weather was getting bad and it was getting dark. So this was the end of day two. And you just know that Horiuchi is just a piece of shit. Well, here's the thing about that. Lon Horiuchi is a highly decorated military sniper. And then he went to the FBI. He's a good shot. And I know that, number one, you don't shoot through an open door where you can't see what's behind your target. And there's so much controversy about this. But in I don't believe that he didn't see Vicki Weaver. 100%. And a lot of people speculate that Vicki Weaver was a big part of Randy Weaver's mentality. She was kind of the aggressor when it came to wanting to move to Idaho, homeschool her children, that it was the end of the world. So they were kind of a team. They really fed off of each other. So there were a lot of statements made that maybe he took out Vicki Weaver on purpose because supposedly it was thought that Vicki Weaver would be the one 
that wouldn't go down and wouldn't surrender. And that Randy Weaver would be actually the easier one to get to do that. So And you know that if they would have killed her husband and she was still standing, they would have had to fight in a court and justify their behavior. And they couldn't. They couldn't. So like we said, that's an unproven thing. Actually, we will get into that in part two. A lot more detail of that whole situation with Lon Horiuchi and the shooting of Vicki Weaver also. There's a lot more to this story than what we're going to get into today. I feel like we should also make a point that we are totally and 100% most of the time pro-law enforcement as long as things are done by the book and the right way. And even if they're not done by the book, you can tell when things are done with the best intentions. We're not pro just random killing people. No, mistakes are made. Mistakes can be made. I get it. And sometimes these high stress situations, things go badly. But there are sometimes when your gut just tells you that this is messed up. And I feel that. So the next morning, an FBI negotiator worked to make surrender announcements to the Weavers, what's left of them, telling them that the outbuildings would be removed if surrender didn't happen soon. They got no response. So the FBI went in and removed the first outbuilding. This is when they say that the body of Sammy Weaver was discovered by them and they were now aware of the boy's death. Still, they got no response from the weavers in the cabin. So what they do with Sammy? I don't know. I would assume that they took him to the coroner's office. That would have been infuriating. Yeah. So Sarah Weaver would look back on this time in interviews stating that at no point did they feel like they were being negotiated with by the FBI. They felt that they were being almost taunted and that any negotiation terms that were presented always seemed like a trick to lure them out of the house and shoot them. None of them felt safe leaving the cabin after this atmosphere had been created. A few more days would pass and nothing was really happening. Still, no shots had been fired from the Weaver cabin, although it was apparent that they were inside. Later interviews with Sarah Weaver described a very tense and tragic atmosphere in the house as well. Sam Weaver's body had been taken away from them, and Vicki Weaver was still in the house with her family. Kevin Harris is in horrible shape and begging Randy Weaver to put him out of his misery, with Randy refusing to kill the teenage boy. The girls were trying to clean up their mom and care for baby Elisheba. All of this time, they state that the feds are outside of the house on bullhorns. Here's another interesting situation when we talk about perspective. The feds claim that at this point, they didn't know that Vicki Weaver had been killed. The Weavers just saw her get sniped and killed, so they think that it was very intentional and the feds knew what they had done. So the feds are outside on bullhorns and they're talking directly to Vicki, constantly addressing her by name. The feds cited the story states that they were trying to appeal to her in a sense that she could still save her children. They would say things like, Vicky, we've got blueberry pancakes out here. Bring the kids out and we'll give them some pancakes. Vicky, don't you want your kids to be safe? Randy is in the house yelling back at them and I don't know if they can hear it or not, but he is yelling things like, you shot my wife, my kid is dead. The anger is building up inside the house with the Weavers because they're under the impression that they are fully aware that Vicky's dead and they are just taunting them. Along with this, interestingly, the FBI was receiving some information now and evidence that seems to be in direct conflict with the information given to them when they were briefed on the case to begin with. In other words, it sounds like Randy Weaver's background And what happened during the initial shootout that killed Sammy Weaver seemed to have been embellished by the local police and the marshals in order to get the FBI involved and all amped up. When the FBI figured this out, those special rules of engagement that they had made when they first got there went out the window. They now instated the FBI's standard deadly force policy at this point. Now that it's too late. So now that we're at Wednesday, August 26, five days into the situation, Randy Weaver reaches out to the officers telling them that he wants to talk to his sister. So they bring her in, and she has to stand so many feet away from the house and talk to him. And Randy doesn't have a bullhorn, so he's just yelling through the plywood walls. They both soon become really frustrated because they can't hear each other, and basically nothing gets accomplished with this. The feds go ahead and take her away, back to the road. On Friday, August 28th, seven days into the situation, Randy asked to speak with a Republican politician named Bo Greitz, and he was able to do this. Bo Greitz was a former Green Beret like Randy, and he remembered Randy from the Special Forces days. He was also a very controversial third-party presidential candidate at the time, and officials drove Bo Greitz up to Randy's cabin in a tank. While they were talking, Randy told Bo that unprovoked, the officers had killed both his son and his wife as well as wounding him and Kevin. That's why Randy was afraid to send anyone out. 
According to him, he wasn't really sure that the rest of his family wouldn't just be shot based on his perspective of what had already happened. Bo seemed to be really getting somewhere with Randy. It really does seem like he understood where Randy was coming from and sincerely was appealing to him. He was kind of telling Randy at this point that he has a really good case for what happened and that he could still come out of this whole thing on top with the rest of his family intact. He also told Randy that if Kevin Harris sits in that house any longer and he dies, that Randy's whole defense here could go out the window because there won't be any evidence that he didn't hold Kevin Harris in that cabin against his will. Greitz seemed like he was afraid that the feds would use that to make it look like a hostage situation and that Randy Weaver confining Kevin in the cabin would be the cause of his death because Randy knew that Kevin needed medical help to save his life and it's been days and days since he was shot. Bo also told Randy that if Kevin sat in that house for any longer and he did die that he would also testify against him in court so he needed to let him out. He Mm -hmm. needed to talk him into going to the hospital. So Bo Greitz, he sounded like a pretty reasonable guy. Randy seemed to believe Greitz and he appreciated his advice. Kevin Harris was still not ready to surrender himself. But that day, Randy did let Bo Grice and a family friend take Vicky's body out of the house, asking them to carry her nicely and not let her body touch the ground. Later that day, in a local Idaho newspaper out of Naples, Bo Grice is quoted as saying, I think this will be over tomorrow. Randy wants to come down off of his mountain with what's left of his family. The article also made note of the huge mob of angry protesters that had been at the roadblock to the cabin every single day throughout the standoff, screaming at officials for what they were doing. They were holding up signs saying things like, this has to stop, or secede Idaho from Fed Nation, and who's next? By the end of the standoff, there were over hundreds of state and federal officers on the scene with rows of army tents, helicopters, tanks, army trucks, etc. Kevin Harris surrendered two days later on August 30th. The Weavers finally emerged from the cabin the day after that, on Monday, August 31st. Randy Weaver walked out hand-in-hand with his remaining children, Sarah, Rachel, and Elisheba. Both Kevin Harris and Randy Weaver were placed under arrest, and they were both charged with the murder of Deputy Marshal William Deegan, as well as the original firearms charge that started the whole thing. And that's it for today. That's what we got for part one. Please join us next week for part two in our exploration into what happened at Ruby Ridge, because there is a whole lot more to it, folks. This week, we kind of went through the events as we knew them, but a lot of interesting things came to light during the trials and the many investigations into the incident that followed. As usual, don't forget to push the subscribe button on whichever podcast platform you listen from, and please don't forget to leave us a rating and a review. It really helps out the show, and we truly appreciate each and every one of them. If you want to contact us for any reason, once again, you can do so via Facebook. You can email us at BigfootForBreakfast at Outlook.com or you can give us a call and leave a message at 641-812-2635 and we'll play it on the air next episode. So we have a couple of contest winners this week, don't we? We do. That we do. So who are they, Samantha? Spin the wheel. The wheel of winning, as you describe it. So while Sam's getting the wheel figured out here, we do want to say thank you to everyone who participated in our latest contest and recommended the show. We really appreciate it and love the interaction. I want to point out, too, that a couple of listeners put some photos on our Facebook page of them standing by the Mothman statue in Point Pleasant, Virginia. So that's pretty cool. And thank you for that, Lisa and Ashley. Okay, Sam, spin the wheel. Wheel of winning. Who is it, Sam? So our first winner is Elizabeth Turner from Missouri. Yay! Who is has been so great and so supportive of our podcast on Twitter. She has been sharing the heck out of us. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. We appreciate it very much. Hey, okay, she's going to do a second winner. Okay. Round two. Spin that sucker. Spin that Who is it, Sam? And our second winner is Kim Jones. Woo, Kim Jones. Do-do-do-do. Also another supportive member of the Bigfoot Squad. The Bigfoot Squad. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> she comes to breakfast. <laughs> we have eggs. <laughs> and great. And stuff. Bacon. <laughs> we do not, in fact, eat Bigfoot. We do not. Yet. All right. So congratulations, Elizabeth Turner, Kim Jones. We'll be in contact with you guys probably on Facebook or Twitter. We need to find out whether you guys want a t-shirt or if you want a Bigfoot for breakfast glitter coffee cup. So you can let us know. We'll get them milled out to y'all. The t-shirts are super soft. Super soft Bella canvas. Oh, we love them. Yeah, they're super soft. Awesome. If that helps sway you in any way. But also the coffee cups keep your coffee hot for a very long time. And they're all glittery. So they're kind of phenomenal. And if you put ice stuff in them, it keeps it cold for a very long time. Well, yeah, both sides of the fence there, right? (laughs) 
all kinds of positives. <laughs> it keeps stuff hot and cold <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> all right. Well, we're out for this week. Please tune in again. Ruby Ridge part two next week. I know it seems like we're done with the story, but I promise you, you won't regret it. There is a lot more and you'll be appalled. You will be so appalled if you're not already. Jaws will drop. Bye. Hi. Come at me, bro.